Egypt, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 5. As we always do, the Bible's purpose, the preacher's purpose, first the Bible's purpose, all scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. The preacher's purpose, 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead and his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, the instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, to all our suffering and doctrine. That's what we seek to do here is to preach the word. Remember in our Bible reading, Paul is writing to Pastor Timothy and the church of Ephesus. He says, watch thou in all things. And as a pastor, I watch. I look at the current things that are about. I think we've got to watch things. A lot of people say, well, what are you watching for things? Because I'm commanded to watch as a preacher of the gospel and the things that are occurring. And you can't believe the MSM, mainstream media. A lot of people are believing the lies of the mainstream media. It's fake stream media is what it is, many of them. There are a few sources to give it to us straight. And so we try to warn people and watch as the Lord has commanded us. Let's begin by reading verse number 8 together. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. The number of verses on truth, truth is found in the Word of God. In John 1, 14, let's say that, we know that one. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In 1 John 1, 17, we know this one too, let's say that one together. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Truth came by the Lord Jesus. Then in John 4, in verse 24, uh, we know that one. Let's say that one together. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then in John 8, verse 32, we know that one too. Let's say that one. And ye shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. For you have the right Bible, and we read the Bible, and we follow the Bible, the truth will make us free. We don't have the right Bible, have the wrong Bible, we don't read the Bible, that truth will not make us free because we don't know the truth. We don't care about the truth. The Lord Jesus has given us the truth in his word. Then in John 8, verse 44, we know that one, let's say that one. Talking about the Pharisees. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the rest of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and bold not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of <clears throat> Satan and all of his tools lies, lies, and lies. He's a liar, he's a father of lies. Satanic lying, not truth. And then John 14, 6, we know this one, let's say this one again. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Thomas Lord, how can we know the way? He said, I'm the way to heaven. Nobody else can get you there to the Bible's heaven. Uh, if you got a false heaven, you should go any way you want. But the Bible's very clear. It's only through the Lord Jesus Christ, a genuine faith. Then in John 16, and verse 13, uh, be it uh, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all the truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever she shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. And so it's important that we know this truth the Lord Jesus has given, New Testament and Old Testament, guiding in all truth. But if we don't use it, it's like having a bar of soap, but you never use the soap to get yourself clean. you got to use the scriptures to get us clean and to abide by them and follow them. And that's what he's given to us. And then in John 17, 17, we know that one. Let's say, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Praying to the Father. The Lord Jesus praying to his Father in high priestly prayer. And then in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 6, uh, perhaps you know this one. Charity rejoices not in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. True love rejoices in truth. And then uh, in Galatians 4, verse 16, this is an interesting verse, because a lot of people, uh, this is true about it. Let's say it together, we know it. 
Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? When you tell truth to people, many people say you're wrong, you're bad, and they become your enemies. Does that should we stop telling truth because it makes a person an enemy? No. We keep telling the truth, preaching the gospel. They don't like it, and they call us enemies. Let them be an enemy. Let them be that. We are enemies. Let them be what they want to be. <laughs> made, made up in their own mind, but we still have to be speaking and telling the truth, the word of God. In Ephesians 4, and verse uh, 15, <clears throat> perhaps you know this one too. But speaking the truth in love, they grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Grow up into him and loving the truth, speaking the truth in love. Then Ephesians 4, verse 25, we might know this, but I'm not sure. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one of another. And then in Ephesians 6, and verse 14, I think you know this one. Stand, therefore, having your loins good about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Loins good about with truth, the truth of the Word of God, makes us able to stand for our Savior in the midst of people and pastors and preachers and politicians that are against our Savior, who don't want to stand for it. Then in 1 Timothy 3, 15, <clears throat> if I tarry long, the time I know how to how us to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And so the church, the believing believers, are the, the, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. The pillar goes up, ground, uh, horizontal. Then we know 2 Timothy uh, 2.15, let's say that one together. Study, to show thyself approved of the God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of the truth. Show ourselves workmen, and that means study. It takes diligence to know what the word of God is and then to apply it and that we could rightly divide the word of truth. Then in 2 Timothy 4, and verse 4, we read some of that similar, and in the last days, and then shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. That's what the new versions have done in many instances. Over uh, thousands of verses have been changed, words have been added, and they turn their ears from the truth that is underlying our King James Bible in the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Then in 1 John 4, uh, John talks to these beloved believers of his. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. That's a great joy that any pastor would have. I would have that joy as well to have everyone walking in truth. Not just in knowing it, but walking in it, following the truth. Now let's read verse number uh, 9 together. For we are glad when we are weak. And you have strong, and this will also wish even your perfection. Now, he doesn't want to be weak, but if that's the case, he'd rather have the believers in Corinth strong, regardless, and even wish their perfection. That word perfection is katartizo, and that word means the mending of nets. It's used in Matthew 4, 21. And going from thence, they saw two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and the ship was Ebedee, their father, mending their nets. That's his word here, mending, getting back to sheep. And you know, Paul wants the Corinthians to have a perfect life, and a, a, a godly life, not completely perfect, but a righteous standing, a righteous life. Perfect, mature, grown up. In Matthew 21 and verse 16, uh, he said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have you never heard? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. Perfected, made mature praise. Then in Luke 6 and verse 40, And the disciples not about his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Lord, complete with all the nets mended, complete will be as the Lord Jesus Christ. He should be our goal. We should follow him in all that we do. Then in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, <clears throat> Paul says to the Corinthian church, the first letter, that he be perfectly joined together in the same mind, the same judgment. Perfectly mature, joined together as a church. Then in Ephesians 4 and verse 12, he talks about the gifts that God has given to the church. Uh, some prophets have asked us, uh, 
evangelists and preachers and pastors are still gifts that remain. But what is the purpose of these gifts? What is the purpose of evangelists or pastors and teachers? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's what we need to do is to perfect and get stronger and make mature the saints for their work in the ministry, uh, edifying the body of Christ. <clears throat> then in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, uh, Paul says, Night and day, praying exceedingly, that, ye might see, that I might see your face, and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Perfect, not the sinlessly perfect, but mature, grown up, <clears throat> not uh, nursing it with a bottle or anything else, uh, not just a small little baby, but a major you know, mature that which is lacking. So the Corinthian church had a lot of things lacking. And Paul wanted to make them mature and grown up, not babies, but mature in the faith. And then Hebrews 13, verse 21. And may the Lord make you perfect in every good work, to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Make you perfect, make you mature. And he wanted the church of Thessalonica grown up and mature in the things of the Lord. That's what this verse means. Then in Hebrews 13, verse 21, <clears throat> the Lord make you perfect in every good work, to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul said in that book of Hebrews, he wants to have them mature and grown up in the faith, and every good work, to do his will, not their own will, but his will, as notified given us in the Word of God. And then in 1 Peter 5 and verse 10, the God of peace, of all grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Notice this, this is something that goes with maturity. After that ye have suffered a while, Christ, he knows they're going to suffer, he's not wishing it upon them, <clears throat> but after you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. After the suffering, make you more mature and grown up in the things of the Lord. That's what he's praying. Let's read verse number 10 together. Therefore, I write these things, being absent, thus being present, I should do service according to the power which the Lord has given me, edification, and not to destruction. <clears throat> uh, as far as the destruction, he didn't want to hurt them or destroy them. But as far as destruction, in Matthew 7, 13, the Lord Jesus taught to enter into the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the gate that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be that go in there at destruction and hell. That's not the destruction God wants his people to be in. Uh, then 2 Corinthians 10, and verse 8, uh, Though I should boast myself more of you, our authority, which the Lord hath given me for edification, not for your destruction. Paul wanted to edify and build up the Christians, and I want to destroy them in any way. And then uh, in 1 Thessalonians 1, and verse 9, uh, it talks about the unbelievers, the unsaved, those that never trust Christ in their hearts genuinely. They'll be punished with everlasting destruction. That's what hell is. It's everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and for the glory of his power. Paul didn't want that destruction anyway for these believers. But he wants to be edified. Edification means to build up. He wanted the believers to be built up in Christ. In Hebrews 14, and verse 8 and 19, uh, Paul says, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. How can we edify and build up one another as believers? We have to know the scriptures in order to be able to use the tools to edify one another and to build us up in the faith. Only by the word of God can we build <coughs> our neighbor. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11, comfort yourselves together and edify one another. Here it is again. One another is to be edified by fellow believers who know the scriptures and know how to build, know how to build up fellow believers. That's very important. Let's read verse number 11 together. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, 
and God is his, and he shall be with you. Here's the four things, vital things, that every church needs. The first one, be perfect. That's again the word contratizo, to be mending all the nets mended, and be mature, is what that means. And that Greek word is contratizo, like we said before, and that means to mend that which is broken. We got to mend that which is broken in our fellow believers. And it means to to make one what what he ought to be. Make one what he ought to be. And there are various verses on maturity or perfection. Matthew four twenty one. In a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. We mentioned that earlier, and that's what we have to do. And then in Matthew twenty one sixteen, God says, I was perfected praise, mature in our praise to the Lord. In Luke 6 and verse 40, uh, we read that also earlier, everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Mature, grown up, the things of the Lord, be as Christ. And then uh, in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, be perfectly joined together, in the same mind, same judgment. That's what a wonderful thing it would be for every church member to be in the same mind, the same judgment. And we've read Ephesians 4, 10, perfecting of the saints, and uh, also in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, and uh, we read Hebrews 13, verse 21 as well. So these are things that God wants every part, every church to be per perfect, mature, and grown up. The second thing that every church should have, vital thing, is be of good comfort. That's a comfort. That's parakaleo. That's what that word means. And that parakaleo is a word that uh, means to uh, comfort one another. It means to console, to encourage, strengthen by consolation. And this is what we need as a church, to comfort one another, not to battle and fight and so on, but to comfort the believers that are genuinely saved Christians. Some verses on that in Acts chapter 9, and verse 31, for example. Uh, then had the churches uh, rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, built up, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. We're multiplied. The Holy Spirit gives comfort to our souls and we to comfort one another in our vital need of every church. And 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 3. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. And we want to pray one for the other. He's the God of all comfort. He's the one that can comfort us. The Holy Spirit can comfort us. We should comfort one another in our church. And then in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 4, <clears throat> talking about the Lord who comforteth us in all our tribulations. We may know this, that we may be able to comfort them when they're in any trouble by the comfort with we ourselves are comforted of God. Uh, Russ and Ann Coot have requested prayer for and to possible surgery. And that's a possible to comfort one another is important. And the word of God is a comfort and God who comforted us that we've been able to comfort them in any trouble. Very important. And then for second Corinthians chapter two and verse seven. Uh, likewise you ought to rather to forgive him, this man that was sinful and he repented, he came back to church. Their second Corinthian church, they threw him out, but they came back and comfort him lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. When we repent and change back and give up our evil, then we can be able to be restored and be comforted by the fellow believers. And then in 2 Corinthians 7, and verse 6, Nevertheless, God, if we know this one, that comforteth those who are cast down, comforteth us for the coming of Titus. He was glad that Titus came to comfort Paul, Paul the Apostle, a great minister of the Lord, needed comfort as well, and Titus helped that comfort. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, the Corinthians, comforted Titus, and Titus comforted Paul. And when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. So the Corinthians had comfort, comforted Titus, and comforted one another as well. Then in Ephesians 6 and verse 22, talking about Tychicus, friend of Paul's. Uh, he was in prison when he wrote this, in the Roman imprisonment. Uh, 
whom I have sent unto you, you Corinthians, for the same purpose, that ye might know of our affairs, that he might comfort your hearts. Comfort the hearts. Not simply the body. You can comfort the pain of the body, but you still may have a, a bad need of comfort of the heart. Very important. Comfort your hearts. Tychicus was able to do that. Then in Colossians 2, in verse 2, that your hearts may be comforted. Here again, the hearts comforted, being knit together in love, and all the riches of the full assurance of understanding, the acknowledgement of the mystery of God in the Father and of Christ. And then Colossians 4, in verse 8, again, Tychicus was sent. But in Colossians 4, in verse 9, <clears throat> talks about with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, uh, who is one of you, there in Colossae, that they shall make known unto you all things which are done here in prison. Uh, he's in Colossians, in prison still. And they shall make known unto you all the things that are done. And Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you. And Marcus, sister son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments, if he come unto you. And Justice, here's another one, who called Jesus, called Justice, is another name for him, or of the circumcision. These only are my fellow workers under the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Paul thanks his fellow believers who comforted him, whether in prison or out of prison, and we can comfort one another. That's one of the vital needs of every local church. And then uh, in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 2, St. Timotheus, here's Timothy, our brother, a minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. The Thessalonian church needed comfort, so Paul sent Timothy to comfort them concerning their faith. And then 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 7, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. The faith that the Thessalonian Christians had comforted Paul's heart by their faith. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. We know this one. Let's say this together. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The comfort of the snatching away in the rapture of the genuine Christians we go to heaven and so many of us when we lose our fellow believers in death they're with the Lord and these verses from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 should comfort the believers about the rapture and about going home to be with Christ when that takes place and then uh, the third vital need of every church is to be of one mind and that word is for now that's the word is for now be of one mind, and uh, some of the main meanings of that word, uh, let's see here, for now is a word that means, let's see here, it's a word for now, here's the meaning of it, to be of the same mind, the same mind, to think the way that the others think, and to be unified in the doctrines of the faith, other things that we should have to be in the same mind as a local church. We have a doctrinal statement. I just heard the other day from a woman who was talking to me, just yesterday I believe, and she said when I went to this church right here close by in New Jersey, they had right in their doctrinal statement, we're going to use the King James Bible. But the preacher today, many preachers since, threw it out and knew something else. Uh, this is a terrible thing. That's not being of one mind and pastor after pastor, that happens. Uh, the church says this is what we use, and they throw it out and use something else. It's a strange thing. You'd think that pastors that come to a church that needs a pastor would be honest and not lie. And when they say, do you, you, the deacons examine them, do you understand our doctrines? Yes. Do you believe our doctrines and our articles of faith? Yes. Do you believe our various things in the Constitution? Yes. And as soon as a six months or a year, two years goes by, they trash what I've got some beginning with the Bible, not of one mind. We should be of one mind. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, <clears throat> I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus, you all speak the same thing. That'd be great. And there be no divisions among you, 
that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. That's why we have our doctrinal statement. <clears throat> uh, one of the people said, well, can I join your church? I said, sure. And uh, here's a doctrinal statement. Do you agree with it? Do you be able to do that? <clears throat> one person recently read it, so I don't agree. So they weren't part of our church. <laughs> uh, there's another uh, couple that's reading the doctrinal statement. I'm glad for that. When they read it, if they agree with it, they can be a member of our church as well. <clears throat> we know those people in Texas, and uh, we trust that will be the case. <clears throat> but these things join together in the same mind and the same judgment. In Philippians 1 and verse 27, let your conversation, your manner of life, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, <clears throat> that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Many people stop at that verse, striving together. No, that's all they do, strive together, fighting up with rock war one after another. We see many churches that way, split after split, but it's striving together for the faith of the gospel, encouraging the faith of the gospel and the word of God. Then in Philippians 2, verse 2, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. That's what this need is, to be of accord, especially of our doctrinal position, the Bible issues, very important. Doesn't mean doesn't mean we have to agree on the color of the carpet or the color of the shades or whatever, but the doctrinal position of our church and uh, of the faith in the scriptures should be of one accord and one of mine. Then in Philippians 4, verse 2, I beseech, beseech you, Odious, I beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. <clears throat> they were fighters, apparently, these two women, and they didn't want to do what was right, they want to do what they wanted to do regardless of whether it was right or wrong. And so that's why some people have changed the spelling of these two ladies. Suntiki, Suntachi, instead of Suntiki. And the other one, uh, what's the other one? Yordas. Uh, Yordas, which, which means well pleasing to malodors. <laughs> Stinky instead of well smell. See, that's what they say. Uh, whether it be true or not, Euodius, you shouldn't take your that they be of the same mind in the Lord. That's important that we do in our church, our doctrines, and our Bible. 1 Peter 3 and verse 8, finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love his brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. So we come to the fourth vital need of a local church, live in peace. Live in peace. Here in verse number 13, number 11. And that peace is a very important, important word, and uh, that that word in the Greek, live in peace, is areneo, 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 areneo for arene. It means to make peace. It means to keep peace, be at peace. It means to be harmonious, in harmony, one to another. And several verses on living in peace in Romans 14:19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. Uh, not fightings, but peace. And things where we may edify one another. Again, build up one another, the things of the Lord. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. We know this. We're going to say that. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Not confusion. He wants peace in our churches. In Galatians 5, verse 22, we know this one. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, against such as no law. But the, the third uh, gift and fruit of the Spirit is peace, love, joy, peace. That's what God wants us to be, have peace with Him. And the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit can give us that peace. And then in Ephesians 4, verse 3, we're endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The bond of peace. Harmony and peace. And then uh, in Colossians 3 and verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Peace of God. Now God can give us peace. Fruit of the Spirit. One of the elements of it is peace. The God of peace. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 12, we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love, for their work's sake, 
and be at peace among yourselves. So esteem the ones that are over them, the pastors, the evangelists, whatever, the servants of the Lord, the missionaries, and be at peace among yourselves. And then in Hebrews 12, verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Many times it's hard to make peace with those who don't want to have peace, but that's what God wants us to do. And 1 Peter 3, verse 11, let him eschew and depart from evil, and do good, let him seek peace and ensue it. The godly people should seek peace and go after it and ensue it without any problems at all. And then uh, the, so those are the four things that every church should have. To be perfect and mature, to be for good comfort, comfort one another, they should be of one mind, and they should seek and live in peace. Pass it all understanding. Let's read verse number 12 together. Greet one another with a holy kiss. This word for kiss is philema. Philema. And it's a two-part word. Phyllis is the first part. Ma is the suffix. And ma means the result of something. So philos is love or friendship. And the result of friendship. And so in the early church, that was a fraternal, holy kiss on the cheeks, that was what they did when they met one another in the church, and uh, when they left, they had that particular uh, practice. Uh, today, maybe for the result of love, we shake hands, we greet one another, but that was a church custom in Bible times. Let's see a few verse, verses on, on this holy kiss. Proverbs 27, verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Judas gave the Lord Jesus a kiss of betrayal, deceitful kiss of an enemy. In Luke 7, verse 45, Lord Jesus said to the man who invited him for, for dinner, Thou gavest me no kiss. That was the custom in the Bible times. Kiss one another, men on the cheek. Holy kiss, not as some romantic type of thing. But this woman who is a sinner, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. Not the cheeks, but the feet. And these Pharisees were upset with the Lord, for he didn't, he didn't do anything uh, right. And so he was reproved, this Pharisee that called him to eat. And in Luke 22, in verse 47, And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, that's Iscariot, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Remember it says, Faith for the wounds of a friend, deceitful the kisses of an enemy. Judas is scared with an enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many enemies of Christ, those that are lost and unsin, don't want to trust him as their Savior. They're enemies. Jesus, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss. Then in Acts 20, verse 37, and they, that is, the pastors, bishops, and elders from Ephesus, they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. That was the custom in that day and age. He was going to go to Jerusalem. They knew that in Jerusalem they would arrest him. They would take him to Rome. And that's what happened. He took Rome as a prisoner. He said, I want to go to fulfill the ministry of the Lord Jesus. And then in Romans 16, verse 16, salute one another with a holy kiss. They did that, and the cheeks on one or the other. That was a custom as they began, entered, and as they closed and left the, the services. First Corinthians 16 and verse 20. Uh, the brethren greet you, greet one another with a an holy kiss. And then First Thessalonians 5 verse 26. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. And then First Peter 5 and verse 14. Greet one another with a kiss of charity. I know in some churches they have the kiss it's not a holy kiss, it's sort of a different type of kiss. We've got to be very careful of those. And uh, we just put the, in remember the philema, philos is love or friendship, ma, the ending, the suffix, a result of something. A result of friendship and love. We have to speak kindly to people, shake hands with people, whatever. And if there is kissing, it should be on the cheek and should be holy, not impure. Let's read verse number 13 together. All the saints, saints salute you. All the saints. Many people don't like that. And all these new versions, they tell me they change the word. But nothing wrong with saints. Hagioi, P 
people that are holy and separated unto the Lord. It's not the Roman Catholic saints. If they're lost and bound for hell, as many of them sure are, if they believe the Catholic religion, the Catholic doctrine of faith, they, many of them aren't even genuine Christians. They're not saints, but saints are genuinely born again Christians, and Christians alone are called saints. Acts 26 and verse 10, which thing, Paul writes, also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison. Before he was saved, he shut up and made him in prison the believers, the Christian saints in Jerusalem. In Romans 1 verse 7, to all that be in Rome, the love of God called to be saints, genuine Christians, saints. In Romans 8 verse 27, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He doesn't make intercession. Lord Jesus doesn't make intercession for the unsaved, godless people that never have trusted Christ personally, but for the saints, genuine Christians, he intercedes for them. Then in Romans 15, verse 25, it says, I go to Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, these believers in Jerusalem. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. They help the poor Christians, genuine Christians, not Muslims, not all the other religions, but the poor saints, Christian believers. Then in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, under the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, called to be genuine Christians. That's what that word means, how you are set apart to the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 2, uh, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? The believers, the genuine Christians, will be a part of the Lord Jesus Christ, judging the world at the world great white throne judgment. We'll be a part of that judgment. Those Christians, genuine Christians. Then in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 1, I concern the collection for the saints, the believers, the genuine believers that needed the help. Then in Ephesians 1 and verse 1, uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus. He was writing from prison, he was in the Roman prison when he wrote this uh, epistle to the Ephesians. To the saints, the true believers, the genuine Christians at Jerusalem. And then one final verse on the saints in Jude 1 3. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that we should earnestly contend for the faith, and that's what we've got to do, which was once delivered unto the saints, unto the Christians. Earnestly contending for the faith, the faith, with an article, the doctrines of the Christian Word of God, the doctrines of the Word of God, the faith, we should earnestly contend for. A lot of people say, well, you're contending for the faith, but you're a little bit contentious. Well, that's an adjective, that's a word that you can use, but we must contend for the faith earnestly, not simply just a half and half. The faith, the doctrines of the faith, everything in Scripture, you got to contend for and earnestly contend for it. Let's read verse number 14 together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Paul is ending of this letter. He says, may the whole Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father, communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Uh, this is a, a wish that Paul has just give you a few verses on the word, the grace of Christ. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is giving us something we don't deserve. That may be with you all. The love of God, the communion of the Spirit. In Romans 16 and verse 20, the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. As Paul ends the letters, many of his letters, the grace be with you. The grace of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> then in Romans 16, in verse 24, that's near the end of the book. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Again, God's grace. In 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, we know that. Let us say that one together. And for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that he through his poverty might be rich. He left heaven, the riches of heaven, came to this earth, to the poverty of being perfect man as well as perfect God. And because for, he, for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich, dying on the cross of Calvary for the sins of the world, in poverty, lost and hell bound, might 
be rich in Christ. Then in Galatians 6 and verse 18, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And in Galatians, are the grace of God. Then in Philippians 4, again, I need to verse chapter of Philippians, the last book, last chapter of the book, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. God's grace. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 28, again, the last chapter, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And then in 2 Thessalonians 3, 18, the last part of that book, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And in Philemon 25, the last part of that book, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And finally, in Revelation 22, 21, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. God's grace, giving us something that we don't deserve. May we be gracious to fellow believers. And that's what we've got to do. The Lord Jesus gave us all these things so that we could know what was his will for our lives. And so this concludes Second Corinthians, Lord willing, we'll take up the book of Galatians, the first half of the next Lord's Day. Uh, but this four vital needs, these four vital needs, that we need to be perfect and mature as a Christian group, built up in the faith, knowing the Word of God, mature. And then the second thing is a very vital need to be of good comfort, comforting our hearts by the Word of God, comforting others or in our church who need the comfort very vital for a good Bible-believing church. And a third vital need be of one mind, a unity on the faith and our doctrinal position of our church and our practices. One mind instead of double-minded or triple-minded or quadruple-minded or all these other minds of one mind uh, and united in the things of our doctrines, the things we believe. The fourth and final vital need is to live in peace, <clears throat> not war, not constantly bickering and fighting and carrying on, but live in peace, a peace that passes all understanding through our Lord Jesus Christ. These things are vital. We trust that our church will continue to you know, take care of all these four things and be, be upstanding in all four of them, vital needs. Not only those that attend our local church, but those who are listening on the internet. We have about 25 families that are with us, listening to us every single Sunday and Thursday, many of them also. And uh, we hope that they will be living in peace and having all of these things together uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're glad for that. We welcome them as well as the ones that are here. Let's close in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for thy grace. We thank you for these four needs of every local church. May our church be part of the fulfillment of those needs. That we may be perfect and mature. May be of good comfort one to another as thou dost comfort us. Be of one mind and united in the things that we believe and live in peace that the Lord Jesus can use us as a believing assembly that we've had going in our 19th year now. So guide us and direct us. Use us to thy glory. There be any in our service that are lost and unsaved. May they come to the Lord Jesus Christ by genuine faith, heart faith, trusting him and be redeemed by his blood. Those world, world believers here, Lord, help us to serve thee and to love thee and unity, and that we may follow our Savior as we read his words and as we follow those words, that we may know the truth that satisfies thee. Thank you, Lord, for these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's take our hymnals again.